Hey folks, how's it going? Cool. Uh, this talk is uh, by Jack Bennett about his uh, personal journey uh, on getting fit using Python. Um, if you have any questions, uh, hold off until the end of the talk and uh, Jack will be more than happy to answer those questions outside in the hall or any uh, or on Twitter. Um, yeah, so Jack. Thank you, Anurag. And thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all for attending Pi Ohio and for attending my talk. This is uh, a very exciting journey for me because Pi Ohio was actually the very first technical community event that I attended uh, since relocating here to Columbus. I arrived about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, in fact, and I was sort of the advanced team. Uh, the rest of my family remained in Boston. And so you might ask, what does a computer nerd do when he's on his own in a city with uh, a whole bunch of meetups and great technical communities? And the answer in my case was I attended tons of meetups, ate a lot of pizza, drank a lot of beer, and uh, put on a bunch of weight. So this it was kind of the starting point, and then that continued um, throughout early 2019, and at a certain point, I got some photos back from, from an earlier conference, and those photos were from the side. So when I was looking straight on into the mirror at my own face, I had a certain perspective on, okay, I, I look a certain way, and then the photos rotated 90 degrees, suggested to me some facts about my, uh, my body weight that I had not previously known. So. I decided to go on a personal journey of, um, of weight loss, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that and how Python and some numerical and analytical data tools in Python were very helpful in, um, in this journey. So I also identify as Jack Bennett, PhD. I don't normally talk about um, having a PhD, but in this case it's necessary for the introductory joke that I'm going to make, which is the following. Uh, some of you may have seen the, the so-called last lecture by um, the late Randy Posh, and um, I love this story. It, he says, after I got my PhD, my mother took great relish in introducing me as, this is my son, he's a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> and. Well, you hope. <laughs> but I'm not your doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I am a doctor, but not the kind of doctor who helps people. And so this is just a disclaimer that um, you should talk to your own medical professionals before implementing any kind of radical changes in your diet, exercise, medication especially. And the informal version of that is body hack at your own risk. And circling back, I absolutely want to help you. I hope this talk is valuable for you. That's my intention for it, that you learn something interesting or at least have a good time hearing my story. So here's the, the quick summary. I would say that choosing a data-driven goal that's really easily measurable and personally important is what's going to make your success possible. So for myself, I chose something that was relevant. Uh, I'd realized I'd put on some, some body weight that I hadn't wanted, and it was measurable. It, the, the body weight is a really simple number to measure. You have a cheap scale. I purchased a uh, $30 scale, and I measured it every day in a very controlled way, and that's something I'll mention later on, is um, controlling your, your measurements is a fundamental aspect of science. You want to do the measurement in exactly the same way, same time if possible, same interval. And if you don't do it at that interval, uh, I'll show you some ways of interpolating. Extreme, extremely simple. Automation is ideal wherever possible. And where it's not possible, we want to keep the manual steps simple. The more complicated your manual involvement is, the less likely you're going to keep this as a habit. And finally, since we're at Pi Ohio and we want to talk about Python, um, 
I emphasize that Python has some powerful, fun, and easy to use analytical tools that you can that you can apply to data analysis. And um, you'll see why this this bottom thing is is so important. I encourage everybody use import IPython and IPython embed. It's like a debugger. It's awesome. So this was me in uh, I think uh, December of 2018, and then. I don't know the exact date of that photo, but maybe maybe a month or two ago. So you can see I uh, I got a shave, I lost a bit of weight, and um, that was that. My wife actually says she likes the the photo on the left better because I got a little smile. She thinks the one on the right is a little bit too American Psycho, which I I get <laughs> the tie and the sort of dead on stare. Um, the reason for that, um, I'll I'll tell you some of the background. The reason for that is. Um, I was trying to get you know good headshots for LinkedIn and whatnot using the portrait mode on the iPhone camera, and so you have to center things really well and put your your head in this little circle on your screen. So it's, it, it makes it very difficult. You, you kind of have to concentrate really hard. So it's hard to smile and coordinate all of these subtle body motions at the same time. So I usually wind up looking very very serious, which. I'm not as serious as the photo looks, I promise you that. So here's some data. Um, so the blue points I call mostly raw data because they're, they're raw measurements, but they include some interpolation. And I'll show you a bit later on how that interpolation operates. It's basically a built-in function of um, one of panda, pandas or NumPy. And, uh, I guess it must be pandas because it's the data frame functionality. So if it's data frame, that means it's pandas. And um, the line, likewise, is a five-day moving average, which smooths out some of the excursions from, from the data. You can see that there are some, um, oops, let's annotate this. Like there are a few outliers. So there's little things that jump above the line. and. One of the things that I'm going to tell you about is areas like this, a five pound weight gain in a day might represent a real emotional spike because if, if you want your number to go down and it goes up significantly, that could be kind of upsetting. So managing the emotional aspects of this is a, is a real, um, it's a very important thing to do. and. Uh, that's, that's one of the non-technical aspects of the journey that I think is pretty important to acknowledge, that it's not just a physical change, but you want to manage your emotional, um, uh, your emotions around this and your psychology around this. And furthermore, I would encourage you to think generally about these principles. If you're not interested in weight loss, that's totally fine. Maybe you're interested in saving money for a special trip or um, buying a new car or something like that. So you might want to look at your savings account. Maybe you want to develop a meditation practice. So you want to track meditating minutes per day. Or um, probably not a ton of salespeople in here, but you know, if, if you make sales calls, you might want to count your sales calls. You know, maybe how long are they, or how many sales calls do you make in a day, and you know, get get some metrics on that. Words written on a novel. Basically, whatever you care about and what, what you can measure, this kind of data is so valuable and so motivating toward a goal. And we can leverage what's called the Hawthorne effect. This was um, something that factory workers about 100 years ago in this giant Hawthorne factory, I think it's in Illinois, um, they, the effect is defined as a type of reactivity in which individuals modify an aspect of their behavior in response to their awareness of being ob observed. And this is really what we're making use of. We're observing ourselves, and the modifications in behavior actually kind of happen automatically. It's, it's an interesting thing to see. And the Hawthorne effect was basically the, the effect of like, oh, I'm on Facebook, but I got to control tab to a different window because the boss walks by. It's, you're modifying your behavior in response to somebody observing you. Um, and in this case, the observer and the observed are the same person. You're just observing your past self. You, you've got a data set about your past self. So why might you want to do this? 
here are some examples. Um, something personally relevant, it can help you change a habit away from one thing and towards something that, that you want. And it's a really great way to learn using a very simple data set. Um, one, one thing that um, people getting into data science want to do is uh, they want machine learning, they want deep learning, they want computer vision, they want something really high end. And it's actually amazing how much you can do with a really, really simple data set. So this, uh, I'm kind of repeating myself here, but um, the highlight at the, the bottom is pretty key. You don't need a lot of data, you just need meaningful and actionable data. And um, I would argue that's what I've gathered in, in uh, this sample here. You need to think like a scientist to do this. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So body weight is not exactly what we want to measure. We, we probably want to measure body fat, by muscle, lean tissue, hydration, stuff like that. And if you go for a DEXA scan every day, Ohio State actually has a great lab for, for that. You can go and pay $75 and get a real breakdown. So you know exactly how much your right arm weighs, left arm weighs, the different parts of your body, ratio of body fat, hydration, so forth and so on. But if you want to do that every day, you've got to take an hour and a half and $70, $75 to do it. So it's much better to track body composition and body weight with a cheap scale, um, even though we recognize it's not as good a measurement as a DEXA scan, for example. Um, it's, it's just something you can do in your home every day and get more data, even if it's imperfect data. And in the case of control what you can and estimate what you can't, what I mean there is if you're going to do this experiment, weigh yourself at the same time every day um, in the same state of hydration, you know, use the bathroom before you weigh yourself or don't, but do the same thing every day and um, wear the same thing. So for example, if you weigh yourself with a certain pair of pajamas on or set of pajamas on, then you wear the same thing every day. So you're not causing fluctuations. The, the very first data point, uh, which I cut off in my data set, was when I was wearing clothes and I had my cell phone on and it was like four pounds heavier than the subsequent one. So I didn't drop four pounds. I just weighed myself in underwear instead of wearing a full suit of clothes with a cell phone that weighs 11 ounces or something like that. So control of your input data is, is important because you have garbage in, garbage out. And although I've been saying losing weight, um, I would actually encourage people in, in this particular case to say something a little bit different. Uh, losing, people don't like to lose, people like to win. So you want to change that to reducing, which is kind of a neutral word, reducing your weight. And similarly, it's not just body weight that you want to reduce, it's body fat, because muscles generally healthier to add and fat is healthier to reduce. And actually it's very specific. There's visceral fat around the bodily organs, like the, the internal organs, is more hazardous to health than subcutaneous fat. So if you've if you got a big belly, that's okay, as long as it's not right around the internal organs. And there's this principle of uh, TOFI or TOFI, I don't know how you say it, but thin outside, fat inside where a person can actually have a, an unhealthy level of visceral body fat even if they, they appear thin. So it's, it's a complicated business, but being really specific about what I want to do and what I don't want to do is, uh, is important in reaching a particular goal. And that's what I mean here. Basically, identify really specifically what you want. If you ask five whys, like, okay, so I want to reduce body fat in a healthy and permanent way. Even having created this talk, I, I still, um, I still uh, default to the habit of um, saying losing weight instead of the, uh, the more uh, specific goal that I talk about. But drilling down and asking five whys is a way to kind of drill down to your real motivation. And in this case, it's, it's basically longevity, being able to spend time with my family, seeing my kids grow up, stuff like that, you know, staying in good health for as long as, as possible and as long as my body is able to do so. 
Um, so you want to find a real motivation and real goal. So here's, here's a system which is uncontrolled, um, input system and output. There's no feedback. When we implement a feedback control loop through measurement, we feed some of the output back to the controller, and that changes the inputs. And so that's, this is kind of the implementation in, in a sort of systems visualization of the Hawthorne effect. We're observing the system, and we can change the inputs according to what we want. So for a um, body weight example, inputs are food, sleep, exercise, outputs, you measure your body weight, and if you pay for an expensive DEXA scan, then you're gonna measure body composition. This is a bit of a verbose slide, but essentially um, what I'm talking about here is um, characterizing your data. Like, giving eight significant figures in, in a body weight measurement is kind of pointless. Uh, and the, the second bullet point, increased or reduced half a pound last week. If you see the data and you see how it fluctuates, dropping half a pound in a week, does, what does that really mean? Your scale is imperfect, the number is a moving target, and so you really need to kind of accumulate data over time to see what you're looking at. Um, so getting into some, some of the technical details, this is, this is what I would love to see. This is not actually what we have but I would love to have a smart scale that just stand on it, writes to some web API um, you know, that I'm hosting in the cloud, maybe have a little Python script that receives that data, you can analyze it, publish it, boom, done. Uh, we do not have anything like this. Um, this is what it would look like schematically. Basically the smart scale just writes over Wi-Fi to my API, I receive data in some standardized JSON format or XML, some kind of standard format. Um, cloud service processes that, writes it to whatever output format I want, and we're done. Um, what we actually have is something imperfect. So the smart scale writes to the smartphone, everything's smart here, um, and the smartphone, which in my case was an Apple iPhone, has this, um, data set called HealthKit and APIs to access HealthKit. And unless you're a iOS programmer, which I'm not, you don't really know how to get into this, there is an app called QS Access that is able to publish this, um, and that works really well. You can also export your entire data set from HealthKit. Um, that, I was trying that for a while but it's just an enormous data set and it makes it complicated. So publish that to Dropbox. So this is unfortunately a manual stage. And then once it's in Dropbox, you can get to it from wherever you want. So I've been using cloud service or my, um, my own computer. So this is what it actually looks like. The, um, the health kit um, bulk export is one way to do it. This is actually very heavyweight because it's a very big data set and it includes a lot of stuff. This is a, a quite a bit simpler and you can publish individual data sets. So that's, that's what I'm talking about here. And so now we have our data finally. What are we gonna do with it? Um, these, are, these are some tools that I would highly recommend you look into. I don't have time to teach them to you in the, in the time that we have, but I can demo a little bit of it. NumPy is basically a tool for array data structures, very efficient. Um, you, see, you see the data types, they're packed C structs, so they're very efficient compared to your regular Python lists and, and tuples. Um, Pandas is a great data manipulation library for time series, and then matplotlib has some beautiful ways to render your data visually, and so I would recommend um, using virtual env. Um, I, uh, I'll show you a little bit use of requests, which essentially reaches to a API, or, uh, or reaches to a HTTP uh, endpoint and grabs the data, and um, if possible, it's nice for, for you to be able to um, use it on your own laptop or desktop so as to 
do interactive graphics, the disadvantage of a cloud service is that you're going to face some challenges there. Although there are um, some of you may be familiar with Jupyter or Jupyter notebooks, which basically give you a web browser interface to a host um, that provides that. Um, I can't really speak to that because I'm not super familiar with it, but it is an option for you. Um, I encourage you to use this. This is awesome. It works like a debugger. Um, and I'll show you um, an example of this. So essentially, you can run a script, stop it, and then interact with it. So you can write your script to set up your environment with all your data, all your variables, all your classes, whatever, whatever you want. And then you're in a REPL session, a read, execute, print loop, and you have all your, um, all your data structures there. So it's a great way to develop because you can, uh, you can debug at the point of where you include this, uh, this little idiom. So I think it's great. Um, I'll just go through some of the data step by step and then, uh, then demo how, uh, how it's rendered in the, um, in the REPL itself. So here's the raw data and you can see some, some zeros. Uh, so the zeros are fake. I didn't disappear during those, um, those points. Uh, they're just days when I didn't, uh, for whatever reason, weigh myself. Maybe I was traveling or something like that. So there's, there's the higher up data, which is the real data, and then there's these fake zeros. So if you strip out the zeros, you get um, nan or non, which is sadly not a delicious Indian flatbread, but a... <laughs> data type that means not a number. And um, so this, this actually gives you more of a zoomed in view of the actual data. So starting at a 210 pounds and uh, dropping down to about 180 or so. So now, now there's some linear interpolation. So you can see going back and forth um, early on, there's kind of a two, two data points separated by a lot. So interpolate a bit just to fill out the graph with a best guess as to what those points might be in, uh, in reality. Um, not as good as a measurement, but a reasonable approximation. And then uh, moving average is basically a way to give you a um, smoothing, sort of like a low pass filter in signal processing. So it, uh, it smooths out the big swings of the data and estimates a line through them. Uh, you, you see there's a, a little bit of an offset too. The, the data gets kind of delayed almost because it's, um, it's pushed to the right as it, um, it, as it incorporates some of, the, uh, some of the averaging over the earlier data points. So that's, um, that's just a, a way to sort of approximate the, the general trend and um, smooth out some of the more uh, radical swings up and down. This is really interesting. This, this was surprising to me. And what this shows is the differences. So this is just the value at um, day n. Uh, so the difference for day n, um, I define it semi-arbitrarily, but not really arbitrarily. Difference at day n is the value of the weight at day n minus the value of the weight at day n minus one. So it's the change, the change over a given day. And what you see is really interesting, uh, to me anyway. Um, if this were your bank account or this were the data that you were measuring, I think you'd find it <laughs> really interesting too. At, but this, this shows that there are many days where there are very small swings, there are many days not so many, but a handful of days where there are very large swings. And a surprising thing is that half the time I'm actually adding weight. Almost, or almost half the time there's an increase. You see, you see a lot of increases. And I think this really ties back into the psychology of things. It's, it's so important to understand in measuring something like this, that there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. And it's, it's um, fascinating that in an area where there's a general trend line, half, 
half the days are up and half the days are down. And you could compare this, for example, it's, it's something very similar to what, uh, what people do in stock trading, which is the, the name return series. Um, that's, that's where the, the name return series comes from. It's the investment returns day by day. And some days are up 2% and some days are down 4%. But a stock is a winner if it uh, rises over um, a long, long term interval. So um, with this, th this is, this is uh, kind of wild. And the, histori uh, the histogram of the changes is very similar. You see about half the time the weight change is positive, and about half the time it's negative. Um, and I will I will share these on on GitHub, so um, you can you can take a look at the um, the PowerPoint as well as the code itself, which we will now take a quick look at. So this is good. The font is big. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, but um, you can you can take a look at this later and certainly ask me any questions. But I'll just run through it uh, rather rapidly. It hits Dropbox, um, does some logging, writes out to a CSV file, and um, cleans it up into a really simple two-column data set. The one column is the date, the other column is the weight. So it's a really simple data set. Uh, about 150 data points, so not very much data. Any um, any modern computer will chew this up and spit it out. And so, I go through it in a in a rather um, cumbersome series of steps. It, it could probably be refactored and simplified a lot. But here's the raw data frame that comes right out of the CSV file, and so I'll just run that. Grabs the data. And this should teach me to do live demos because I think I need to connect to the phone. But um, all right, we're connected. Yeah, I think uh, there we go. Can we get the data? Yes, we can. Um, so here we are now at, at the REPL, the read, execute, print loop. And we've got, um, we've got some variables. So th these, these things tagged with a um, trailing number are the variables. So just a, just a real quick view. Um, so here's your different series, for example. I hope this just gives you a sense of, of the interactivity here. It just pops up a plot. Um, the default plots look pretty nice. Here's the differences. So you see the ups and the downs. You can close that. Here's, um, oops. Here's the data with interpolation, interp df3. And then you can plot this and get an interactive. Um, I have some commands saved here so that you can, for example, grab moving averages. Um, so here's like a one week moving average, so it sort of smooths the data out. Um, you can view it, it pretty prints it, which is really nice. So you see um, the first several values are not a number because it's actually sort of chews up those data values in creating the first moving average value. So then you plot it again, and what happens? Wow, there's another number, or there's another series. So you've got your seven-day moving average smoothed out there. So I'm running out of time, but I hope this gives you a flavor of what we can do with pandas and NumPy and matplotlib. Um, just recapping, I would encourage you to, if you want to do the same thing, pick a goal that's easily measurable and meaningful to you. Just measure it day by day or hour by hour, whatever, whatever time frame you want. And uh, you can easily um, 
get a small, simple data set that's personally valuable and helps you change habits, change your life. Um, potential future extensions, I, I don't really have time to go into that, but you can certainly find this on, uh, on the GitHub, github.com slash AJ Bennett slash PyOhio Demo 2019. And uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it.